So Genesis chapter 22, probably one of the most famous and familiar texts in all of Scripture. The greatest test of Abraham's faith. And there are many ways of looking at this passage. Uh, I've heard it preached many different ways. You can't escape the portraits of Christ that are in this as well in God not requiring Isaac, but providing a lamb. I'm thankful he doesn't require our blood, but he provides blood through, the son, through the, uh, his son, Jesus Christ. And so there are many different pictures, but my goal tonight is to look at this in its historical context. What this test meant for Abraham, what it meant for his covenant relationship with God, and ultimately what was intended for the original readers, the children of Israel, and their relationship with God. And so there's a specific focus that this text has that I want us to give our attention to tonight, and I believe it'll be a help. I'm not sure if maybe you've heard it preached this way or not, but I know I hadn't. Sometimes as a preacher, as you're studying the Word of God, that makes you think, do I have this right? <laughs> if I haven't heard specifically anybody preach it this particular way, but I believe just from studying it out, this is exactly what God's intent was. And so we're going to be looking at this thought tonight, the true test of covenant faith. The idea again there of covenant has to do with relationship. God's in a covenant relationship with Abraham. And did you know that through Jesus Christ, he's in a covenant relationship with you? And a covenant relationship with me. And so it has great meaning for us tonight. So we're going to read uh, chapter 22, verses 1 through verse 19. I realize a little bit of a lengthy reading. And so uh, bear with, try to stay in tune. I know that's tough, uh, but, but I believe it'll help you. I'm not going to go verse by verse through the story again. And so this is our time to go verse by verse and to see it. And so let's read this together. Verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. <clears throat> and Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father? And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. <clears throat> And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. <clears throat> and he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. 
the Lord provides. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together, all four of them, to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. The true test of covenant faith. May God bless his word. You can be seated, and we'll consider this message tonight. <clears throat> Testing is a regular part of our educational lives. You know, as you go to school, that you're going to have the daily instruction, of course, in the classroom. You're going to be taking notes. You're going to be filling in an outline, and then you're going to have daily homework assignments that might involve some reading. It might involve some questions that you got to answer from your reading. Uh, it, it might involve uh, some type of research that you got to do or writing a paper. And so you've got your daily work, but what's with the tests? I mean, you ever thought about that? What's the point of having this blank sheet of paper and nothing but my pencil, my hand, and my brain? What's the point of the test? So when I was in school, we did achievement tests called Stanford Achievement Tests every year. It took about three days out of the school year and there were these long red sheets of paper and they covered general education, you know, math, science, history, English, and we would fill out those, those little holes. It was like voting, you know, you fill out the little circles in there and do that for three consecutive school days. It was a lot to do. And you know, as, as a teenager, I'm going through this in high school, and I'm thinking, what is the point of this? I mean, what is the point of a test? We get the daily assignments. That's to absorb the knowledge, to be sure that we're soaking it in like a sponge and that we're growing in our wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of those specific subjects. But why the tests? If you really think about it, the test is not for you. The test is not for you. The test is for the teacher. So the teacher can grade how well you're doing in this class, how well you're absorbing the knowledge in the day to day, how well you're soaking it in, how, how good your understanding is. And if you're able to go on to the next grade or if you need a little bit more focus in this grade again. And so it benefits the teacher. Think about the ACT and the SAT that you take that big, long test before college. Why do you take that test? Is that for your benefit? No, it's so the college can look at it and see, is this person going to be academically acceptable at Harvard? <laughs> you know, if you get a low score, that's probably not going to happen. And so they want to make sure that the people that they're admitting into their school are going to be acceptable from their academic uh, standpoint. But we realize that while that test is primarily for the college, it's also beneficial to you from this standpoint that if you pass it with high scores, you can be admitted into the college. You can be admitted into that university. And so there are benefits that go both ways, but primarily the test is for the teacher's sake. In Genesis 22, God gives Abraham the toughest test of his life. God has come to Abraham and appeared to him in Ur of the Chaldees. And he said, I want you to leave your father and your mother behind. I want you to forsake your family in this land. And I want you to go. Where, Lord? I'll let you know. <laughs> but he was able to leave and he knows, okay, God's going to lead me to a specific place. So he takes that step of faith and he begins following God. And then God promises that he's going to give him the land of Canaan. And he promises that he's going to give him a son, even when his wife was barren, that in this child, he was going to bless all the nations of the earth. And he was going to bless those who bless Abraham and curse those who curse Abraham. And along the way, he's had these tests of faith. Some of them he's succeeded and some of them he's failed. 
But ultimately, uh, he comes to this test, and this is the greatest test of his life, and here's the reason why. There is no promise beyond Isaac. There's no promise of another child. And yet God appears to him and he says, I want you to take the promised son, the one that you've been waiting for, the one that I've finally given you and the one through whom all my promises are to flow to your children. I want you to offer him up as a burnt offering. And the question is really this. Why is God testing Abraham in the first place? Why is he giving him this particular test? What does he want to know? I mean, think about this. God's the teacher here in the school of faith. Abraham is the pupil in the school of faith. And so this test is not for Abraham's sake necessarily. This test is for God's sake. And ultimately it's going to have benefits in Abraham's life. But there's something that God wants to know in this situation. And so why does God test Abraham? What's the purpose in this? You know, you ever asked why God tests our faith? Why he brings us through seasons of life that would cause us to struggle, that would cause us to grapple things that might even be hurtful, uh, things that might, uh, m- might cause us to struggle in life. Why would he allow us to fall on financially hard times? why he would allow us to lose a job or why he would allow my car to break down at this time. Why would allow the AC to break down at this time? Hottest time. He couldn't, have, we're talking about this this morning. Couldn't that have happened back in April, you know, and it was a little cooler. And why this weekend, you know, and it's over a hundred. You get those tests that you face. Why did he allow me to have this chronic health problem in my life? Why isn't God allowing me to get married? God, I love you. I've trusted Jesus Christ. I'm faithful to church. I know I'm not perfect, but I do the best that I possibly can. And yet I'm still going through this. Why would God allow me to be put to the test like this? And so what I want to talk about tonight is really why God, why God puts our faith to the test. What his purpose is behind it. And, and what he wants to know through it, what he wants to experience through it is what we're going to see and how that benefits us. The events of chapter two, 22 take place following a time when God has removed every obstacle in Abraham's life to fulfilling the promises. And now God is actively fulfilling the promises. It says in verse one, it came to pass after these things. And so that's that's still connecting us to the previous chapters that God has given Abraham the son of promise in Isaac. And now God has also given him his first parcel of land in this well where he calls Beersheba, what would be representative of the southern border of the nation of Israel. So God's actively fulfilling his promises and the stage is set here for Abraham to enjoy the twilight years of his life, enjoying the promised land alongside his son Isaac. That's how it's set up. But then we come to this striking statement in verse 1. It says, After these things that God did tempt Abraham. Tempt. When you see that word tempt, of course, we think that uh, we think of sin, that it's like God is tempting Abraham to do something bad, but that's not what this particular word means. In fact, in the book of James, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God tempteth no man of, uh, God tempteth no man of evil, neither is he tempted. And so God is not going to tempt man to sin. What this particular word means is to test. It means to put to trial. It means to uh, exor- uh, to have a training exercise is, is really what the word t- attempt means here. When you buy a new golf club, you go to the golf store and you can go through and see which ones you might like. And so you p- might pick out two or three different ones. Then you can go over to the practice booth and you can line yourself up and it's got a net there and you can, you can swing back and swing through just like you're hitting and it's, it's testing it out. You're, you're getting some experience with it. Why are you doing that? You're seeing if it's compatible. 
You're seeing if it's got the right feel, if it's long enough, or maybe you need some extensions on it. And so you're, you're testing this out to see if it's, it's going to be useful to you when you go golfing. That's the idea of the word tempt here. That God has been on this journey with Abraham and he's entered into this covenant relationship with Abraham that's based upon faith. It's based on faith. And he has promised to bless Abraham, to multiply his seed as the stars of heaven through his son Isaac. And he's promised to give his children the land of Canaan for a possession. But as Abraham has seen God unfold and fulfill his promises, there's some question related to this. Is Abraham following God because of of the promises of God? Or is Abraham following God because of who God is? And so you have this question here. Is he in it for the perks? Is he in it for the blessings? I mean, you think of the book of Job and how Satan comes before God and, and he says, doth not Job serve God for naught? You've blessed his life. You've loaded him with benefits, as we read from the scripture this morning. You've blessed his life, but I'll tell you this, you take all those blessings away and he's going to curse God to your face. That's what Satan said. And there might be some question here about Abraham about the same thing. Oh sure, it's easy to follow God when you got all these promises, but what happens when you don't? And so uh, we got to realize that what God is doing here is he is creating a scenario in Abraham's life that's going to test his faith. You know, sometimes we have crises in life that are just part of the normal course of life. That, that there's a time and a season for everything, as the book of Ecclesiastes says. And so there are times in the normal course of life that we face crises. I think of Abraham's life. That would be like the famine. That famine just come and go over there in the Middle East. And so he deals with the famine and he's got a choice to respond there. Maybe the barrenness of his wife, that that's something that's completely out of their control. It's just the way that her body developed. And so there was that inability to have kids. And so there are things in our life that, that happen that are tough, that are difficult. And it's something that everybody else is going through too, like famines of inflation and those kind of things. Then there are uh, situations that come about in our lives that are crisis filled because of our own mistakes. I think of Abraham, the mistakes that he made going down to Egypt, failing to trust God, uh, having a child with Hagar, and that created some problems in his life, and uh, telling Abimelech that Sarah is his sister, and another king that Sarah is his sister, and the problems that that brought into his life. And so there are decisions that we can make that can bring crises into our life. But let's also remember that there are certain times you can be doing every single thing right in your life and there's a crisis that comes because God has directly put it there in your life. We can't escape that. that. Sometimes God puts him there and he has a purpose and that's what's going on in Abraham's life here. God tells him, take your son. And the emphasis here in verse number two, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. That points our attention to this. This is the son of his old age. This is the son that God had promised to him. And he says, I want you to take him into the land of Moriah and I want you to offer him up for a burnt offering. Now there's a lot to unpack here and we're going to unfold some of it. Talk about the land of Moriah. That, that's an, a region near Jerusalem. And of course, Jerusalem, not highly developed at the time that Abraham uh, was there. It's called Salem at that time. And, and so not very developed. So the land of Moriah is more like a rural land at this point. And the word Moriah means chosen of the Lord. Moriah, chosen of the Lord, Jehovah. And so this is a land that, that God specifically chooses out. For this offering, it's likely that the land of Moriah, the name was actually given to it uh, following this, that God's saying, go to the land of my choice. I'll let you know, just like when he came out of Ur of the Chaldees, I'll let you know. And so he tells him, I want you to head in that direction. And then you're going to go into one of the mountains and you're going to offer him up for a burnt offering. The land of Moriah is a special place. It is the place also that carries great significance with the nation of Israel because 
When David commits the sin of numbering the people in the pride of his heart, a plague sets out amongst the people and 70,000 people died because of his sin. And God tells him as he repents and as he begs God for mercy, God tells him, I want you to go to Mount Moriah, the same mount where Isaac was to be offered. And I want you to purchase that mountain from Ornan the Jebusite and you're to offer up a sacrifice there to atone for the sin and to stay the plague. And so David purchases that land and then that land is where the temple would be built. God's chosen land, Moriah. That is also the place where all the atoning sacrifices would be offered up daily and yearly for the sins of the people. But listen, it's also the place where when Jesus returns, he's going to set up his throne room in the Holy of Holies, and he's going to reign for a thousand years in his millennial kingdom. I'm telling you, Moriah is a special place, and it finds its root right here. He's to go to the land of Moriah, and he's to offer up his only son, the son of promise, the son in whom all the blessings and promises of God are wrapped up and he's to offer him as a burnt offering. Doesn't that strike you? God requiring a child sacrifice. You know, that startles us because you can look at the Old Testament law and he commands them not to allow their children to pass through the fire unto Molech. He tells that one of the reasons why Israel was condemned later on and carried on into Babylonian captivity was because they were offering their children unto Molech. And God said this, which thing I never required and never even entered into my mind. And so we have this hindsight that God loathes child sacrifice. And yet here he is asking this of Abraham. It causes us to question, why is that? Well, we've got to remember this. Abraham didn't have all the scriptures. He's still discovering who God is. The nation of Israel that's reading this for the first time is still discovering who God is. And they see all the gods of the land of Canaan. And Moloch is one of those predominant gods. And so they have people there that are offering their children for sacrifices. And, and what I believe God includes this for, and the reason why he does this in particular, is to show them, are you listening? To show them, I am not like the gods of this land. I do not require, in fact, child sacrifice. But to get to that point and to reveal it. And so he, he has him, and with the hindsight that we have, that God is not going to require sacrifice, he shows Israel this reasoning so they know that, that the God that they serve is distinct, that he's not just grouped in, that he's not just going by another name, but he's an altogether different God because he doesn't require this. But this is the test for Abraham. It's the test that all of God's promises are wrapped up in Isaac. There is no promise of another child. There's no promise to look forward to beyond Isaac. The test is really this. Will Abraham follow God when there's no tangible benefit for himself? Well, let's find out what happens. It says, in verse 3, that Abraham rose up early in the morning. He wasted no time to do what God had told him to do. He saddles a donkey and he takes two young men servants with him as well as Isaac. And he goes and he splits some wood and they begin to make their way to the land of Moriah. And it says that about three days into the journey, he saw the place. He saw the mountain that God had chosen. And so he talks to his two servants and he leaves them there. And he and Isaac go by themselves to Mount Moriah for this sacrifice that Isaac was not aware of. But I want to point out to you a couple things here that reveal Abraham's faith along the way. Because if you look with me at verse 5, it says, And Abraham said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. Now, these verbs here, uh, when it says uh, there in verse uh, number five, when he says, I and the lad will go yonder, worship, come again. Those are all plural. You know what that means? Abraham says, I'm not coming back by myself. 
I'm not going up there by myself. I'm not going up to worship by myself. And I'm not coming back by myself. No, Isaac is coming with me. And so he's got this assurance and this faith in his heart that says, I know this is what God's required, but I'm fully confident he's not really going to require it. Abraham is kind of learning along the way. This isn't a God like the other gods of the land. This doesn't match with his promise. And so I'm just going to trust. I'm just going to go. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to do what he says. And I'm going to trust he's going to take care of it. Because then what you see is he leaves them and he gives Isaac the wood. He takes the fire in his hand and he takes a knife. And he and Isaac begin to head up. And then you have that awkward conversation of verse number seven, where Isaac says, "Um, Dad, yes, my son, I see the fire. And I've got the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And look at Abraham in verse 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. That word provide there, its literal translation would be, the Lord will see to it that there's a lamb for a burnt offering. He's going to see to it that the details are taken care of. All I know, Isaac, God has told us to go up and he's told us to offer a sacrifice, but you can see the faith in Abraham. He believes Isaac is not going to be the sacrifice that God is going to require of me. He's going to provide himself a lamb. And so he makes this statement uh, of great faith. And so we can see that although he's dealing with a very unique situation and God is putting his, his faith to the test, we can see to it that he has the faith that God is going to take care of the details if I will just follow him. Well, when they arrive at the God-appointed place, Abraham builds the altar and he lays out the wood in proper order. And then he takes his son Isaac, probably six years old, seven years old at this point. And he ties him up, binds him hand and feet, He sets him there on the altar and he takes the knife in his hand and he rears it back. He's ready to go all the way. He's ready to do what God has told him to do here. I can't imagine what Abraham is going through right now in his mind. We've seen his faith, but there's still got to be something inside of him. I imagine if this was me, there'd be a lot of fear, a lot of confusion. I'd be struggling, worried, and afraid. I'd be thinking, uh, you know, he's, he's laying there and he's confused. He doesn't know what this is about. And he's never seen them offer a human being for a sacrifice before. And he understands he's the child of promise. And I imagine maybe the screams and the fear and the cries, and the concern of this child as he's laying there bound on the altar and he sees his dad pull the knife back. I imagine he's thinking about the conversation with Sarah that's going to follow this and what, what he had to do and what God required of the only son that she was ever able able to have in her entire life. I'd be thinking through the memories of my son in his first six years of life. I'd be thinking about his future and all those future dreams flashing through my eyes. I, I, I can't imagine that this was easy. Well, how could Abraham, how could he go so far as to pull the knife all the way back? Well, if you look at Hebrews chapter 11, it says, by faith, Abraham offered Isaac, the son of promise. And it says that he did so accounting that God could raise him from the dead. That's his faith in God. He says, I mean, he said here, we're going to come back again. We're going to come. And then he tells his son, God's going to provide himself a lamb, but he doesn't see the lamb. And so he's pulling the knife back and he says, God can raise him from the dead. And so you can still see his faith, but we know that that is not what God was going to require of Abraham. He pulls that backstroke with the knife in his hand. And just as he's going forward, Abraham, Abraham, and he stops in his tracks. Here am I, Lord. And he says, look at verse number, uh, verse number 12. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything to him. For I know, here you go, for I know that thou 
Fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. You know what God is saying? Here's what this test is for. I know now, because you were willing to go all the way and you were willing to to, uh, kill the promised son, you were willing to do without the promised son, I know now that you fear me. But this word fear doesn't mean he's scared. It doesn't mean that Abraham is scared of God, that he's so scared of God that he's like, if I don't do this, God's just going to kill me. That's not what this is talking about. The word fear means to give reverence. It means to respect. And so when you think about it, here's what God is saying. Don't touch the lad because you have not withheld him from me. I now know not just cognitively and understanding because we know God's omniscient, right? God knows all things. He knew exactly this would happen before he ever created the world. And so it's not about cognitive knowledge. It's about experiential knowledge. There's something here that God wants to have an experience of faith between him and Abraham. It has to do with their relationship together. And he says, through this test, through you passing this test with flying colors, I know this, that you respect me. You respect my person more than my promise. And he says, I know it. There's no reason for you to kill him. So then what happens is it says in verse 13, sure enough, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Abraham was committed to following God even if it meant taking the life of his promised son, even if it meant facing a dark and uncertain future, but that wasn't what God required, was it? Now, just as Abraham believed God provided a ram for a burnt offering, the Lord saw to the details. He honored Abraham's faith. He showed Once and for all, I am a God that does not require the blood sacrifice of a sinner. I am the kind of God who provides innocent blood on behalf of the sinner. He says, I'm that kind of God. So what is the purpose behind all this? Why make Abraham go through this experience, this training exercise, this difficult test of his faith? Well, God carried out this test of Abraham's faith for a purpose that is expressed in certain terms in verse 12. For I know that thou fearest God. See, this text is not about God's omniscience. It's not that God needed to know something. It was about that experience. This text is about Abraham's relationship with God. The reason why I say that is because there's question right now looking at Abraham's life about whether or not Abraham's relationship with God is wrapped up in the promises of God or if it's wrapped up in the person of God. And what God is doing through this particular test is he is settling once and for all that Abraham's relationship with God was centered upon God's person, not his promises. See, think about it. It's easy to trust God when you've got the promises on the other side. When God says, do this and I'll do that, do this and I'll do that, do this and I'll do that. That's what God's been doing with Abraham thus far. And so somebody from the outside could look at this and say, yeah, it's real easy to exercise faith like Abraham because he had all these promises laid out in front of him because he had begun to fulfill those promises laid out to him. But when it comes to this particular thing, you know what God doesn't do here in chapter 22? He doesn't say, offer up Isaac and I'll do this. He just says, offer him up. 
He, he says there's no strings attached here. There's no promise attached to this. It's easy to trust God when you have promises on the other side, but what about when there is no promise? What about when it makes no sense? What about when it seems to go against who you've known God to be? What about do you trust God when he's leading you into the darkness of an uncertain future? Do you trust God when he allows you to lose a child or when he allows you to lose a spouse? Do you trust God when you lose your house? Do you trust God when your bank account's empty? Do you trust God enough to obey him and to follow him when there's no light at the end of the tunnel? This is the test God is putting before Abraham. And what we see here is that God tested Abraham's faith to ensure that their relationship was not based upon the promises of God, but upon the person of God. See, when we fall on hard times in life, we cannot dismiss the potential that this difficult situation is a test of my faith that has been put in my life directly by God. We've got to consider that. Because as believers, we're not exempt from facing difficulties in life, are we? Believers still have miscarriages. Believers still have an unfaithful spouse and a divorce. Believers still lose children from a drunk driver. It's because of cancer in their 30s. Believers leave behind. When that happens, they end up leaving behind a spouse and leaving behind a family of three, four, or five kids. I just saw on social media today that there's a pastor who lost his life. He drowned in the lake saving his daughter, his young daughter. And so while there's the, the joy that that daughter's life was saved, there's the grief that the husband has been lost. And it's not just a husband. He's a father. He's a pastor to a church just like this. And now people are going through a situation where they're without this man. That happens to believers too. Believers still go through the aftermath of tornadoes, hurricanes, and fires. They still experience layoffs at work. They still experience inflation and gas prices. You know, it's not like you go to Walmart and you have your Christian card and because you swipe a Christian card, it gives you the low price, right? Or you go to King Supers and you go to get gas and you swipe your Christian card and it gives you $2 a gallon. No, we all go through the same thing. Believers still have car problems. They still get eviction notices. They still end up in car accidents and hospitals and lonely long-term care facilities. And believers, even the believers who don't believe in COVID still get COVID. <laughs> We're all subject to tests and trials in our lives that can exasperate our faith, wear us out, make life seem difficult. And what happens is the underlying question in those situations, whether we express it or if we bottle it up inside, the underlying question beneath the surface is this, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Why am I having to deal with this hardship? Why am I having to deal with this health problem? Why am I having to deal with this layoff? Why am I struggling so hard financially? Well, couldn't you just take this out of my life? I mean, I, I believe in you. I follow you. I obey you. I, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm doing the best I can. Couldn't you have taken this out of my life? Couldn't you have healed me? Now, couldn't you have stopped that drunk from getting in his car? Couldn't you have crashed him into a tree instead of into my baby? These are the things that people go through. The things that people experience and believers are no different. You can feel like I'm being attacked from all angles and I just don't get it. Everything's falling apart. The truth is that it's possible. I'm not going to guarantee it, but it's possible. Some attacks are from Satan some things happen because the normal course of life. Is this ringing a bell? Some things happen because God wanted it to. It's quite possible that God is testing your faith. Someone might object and say, say that's really cruel way just to test my faith to put me through this. 
And if you aren't careful, you can end up resenting God for the tests that he brings into your life. But the tests he brings into our lives are not there to hurt us. They're not there for our harm. They're not there because God gets some sick and twisted joy out of watching you struggle. No, rather they're there to help us grow into a better and deeper relationship with God. See, God tests our faith to ensure that our relationship with Him is not based on what He gives, but on who He is. Did you catch that? That when, when God puts a test in your life, when He brings something into your life that's there for a purpose, that causes some grief, that causes some pain, that causes some struggles, when life isn't just going along smoothly, understand that is there for a purpose. And the purpose is that God wants to ensure that your relationship with Him is not wrapped up in the things that He gives you, but that it's wrapped up in who He is as a person. And some would look at that and they would say, that sounds mighty selfish of God but the reality is God created me God knows me better than I know myself God knows what I need more than I know and he knows the kind of relationship with him that'll enhance my life that'll make it joyful and satisfying and fulfilling even when life is not going the way that I want it to See, God is doing what is best for us. And what is best for us is not that we have a relationship with Him that is wrapped up in what He gives us, but that we have a relationship with Him that is wrapped up in who He is. That is the best thing that we need in our lives. What God is doing through these tests is He is calling us to a deeper, a more intimate, a more transcendent relationship with him one that remains rock solid through the ups and downs of life one that that can withstand the struggles and the storms of life one that is not based on self-interest but one that is based on mutual love for God we're talking about listen we're talking about the God of the universe the God who created everything the God who transcends time and eternity. The God who is bigger and far more vast than we can comprehend with our finite brains. And that God steps into your life because He wants that kind of relationship with you personally. There is no other God like Him. He transcends the other gods that require you to offer a sacrifice, a human sacrifice. He transcends the other gods that require you to crawl across nails and glass and coals of fire. No, He's a God that went through the fire for us. He's a God who left heaven and came down and condescended to us. He's a God who sent His only begotten and beloved Son to die on the cross and to be a living sacrifice so that we could have a restored relationship with Him and one that's not based on the benefits and the blessings and what He gives, but is based upon the reality of who He is. What a God. That's not a God to resent. That's a God to love. That's a God to embrace because the reality is, is He wants to bring us into that kind of relationship with Him. Think about this for a moment. What if my marriage relationship was boiled down to what my wife gives me? If I loved her because she gave me a house, if I loved her because she gave me a car or a fancy suit, if I loved her because she gives me birthday cards and Christmas cards and Father's Day cards and Valentine's Day cards and random cards and writes me random notes and all these things that, that she gives me, well, what about when those gifts stop? What kind of marriage is that? Do I have the kind of love? Is my love going to be so wrapped up in her? But if my love is wrapped up in those gifts, we'll have really no marriage relationship at all. If we can understand that with marriage, how much more with God? 
that what kind of love is it if our love for God is only attached to the blessings and benefits that he gives me? To where when life gets hard, to where when the tests come, to where when the money's gone, when the job's gone, when I lose somebody in my life, that I would just go away from God. What kind of love is that? That's not the kind of love God knows you need and God wants you to have. And so he'll bring these tests into our lives for the purpose of bringing us into a deeper relationship with him. The true litmus test of whether or of where your relationship with God is, is this. Would you follow him if there was absolutely nothing in it for you? Would you follow him? We sure fall short of that standard, don't we? Our faith, if we're honest, our faith is as imperfect as our fallen condition. Sometimes we're weak in faith. Sometimes we trust God in the high times. We turn and run in the low times. But I'm thankful that just like God didn't require the blood of Isaac, God doesn't require our perfection. But instead, he provided himself a lamb when he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to pay the price for our sin, and to redeem us and restore this relationship to God. He did what we couldn't do. He obeyed and followed God to his very death. He atoned for our shortcomings. And all he requires is simple faith. Simple faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But you know what? As children of God, our lives are going to be full of tests and trials that purge and purify our faith. That takes us from being in it for us to being in it for Him. He demonstrated such desire for that kind of relationship that He came to die. And He died in our place and he is working through our tests to bring us to the same level of love and relationship to him as he has to us. That's something to embrace, not to resent. Why is it important that we have that kind of relationship with him? Why was it so important for God to test Abraham's faith and to ensure this relationship? Well, it's important because of what comes next. Read with me verses 15 through verse 19, and we'll finish up. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself, not by you, not by an animal, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together, all four of them to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. The covenant blessings of God are reserved for those whose faith exclusively rests in God. That's the point here. God's in a covenant relationship with Abraham. And he wants to bless not just Abraham, but all the nations of the earth. And that includes us here tonight. He wants to bless all the nations of the earth with a Savior, but he wants Israel to understand, and he wants us to understand that the covenant blessing was not given to Abraham for any reason other than his faith was exclusively in the person of God. And just in case we would be tempted to look at Abraham's life and say, it's easy for him to trust God because he had all the promises, we can look at this situation and say, he trusted God when there was no promise, and it was that faith in God, that that 
that unfolded the blessings of God in his life. Where God swears now in the strongest way possible by his own person that this blessing is going to come to pass. Through Abraham, God has blessed us with a Savior, Jesus, who came to take away our sin through his substitutionary death on the cross. He came to bless us with this restored relationship with God. That was the ultimate blessing of the covenant God gave to Abraham to bless all the nations of the earth through his seed. Jesus is that seed. But all the blessings of the new covenant are reserved for those who place their faith exclusively in the person of Jesus Christ. To receive the full blessings of the new covenant, salvation, forgiveness, eternal life, restored, renewed relationship with God, to receive the blessings of the new covenant, your faith can't be in the favorability of your circumstances. It, it can't be in the things that God gives. It's got to be in who Jesus is. He is the sinless Son of God who died in your place to redeem you from your sin. So have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? If you have trusted Him, let me ask you this. Where's your relationship with God? Are you in it because of what He gives? Or are you in it because of who He is? If you're going through a test right now in your life, don't resent that. See it for what it truly is. And that is the God of heaven being so desirous to pull you up out of this artificial relationship with him that's based upon promises and blessings and benefits and to bring you into a transcendent relationship with God that surpasses your circumstances in life. One that brings you in absolute fellowship and communion with your creator no matter what is going on in your life. So rather than resenting him for it, love him and keep following him through it. Lord, we come to you tonight and are grateful for this text. <clears throat> I'm thankful that it gives us some insight into the struggles and the tests that we go through. That God, you desire to bring us into a deeper relationship with you. And sometimes that comes through pain. Sometimes that comes through difficulty. But I'm reminded that a marriage relationship is strengthened when they go through a struggle together. A relationship between a parent and a child is strengthened when they go through a struggle together. Our muscles are strengthened as we tear them in lifting weights. And it works the same way with our relationship with you. There can be pain. There can be hurt. But if we'll keep following you and trusting in you, that relationship can be built to go far beyond just how, how good our life is right now. We can be content, satisfied, and fulfilled in that relationship with you. And the only reason it's possible is because of Jesus Christ. And it's because of the tests that you bring us through. I don't know what your people are going through exactly. Maybe internal fears and struggles. But I pray they look to the hope of the God who loves them, gave himself for them, and wants to bring them closer to him. I pray if there's anyone that's not trusted Jesus as their savior, that they'd make that decision and cast all their faith upon his death, burial, and resurrection for their forgiveness and their salvation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's take a